Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In 1955, two families in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, survived one of the craziest alien encounters ever recorded. Not only did they see a flying saucer, but they engaged in a gunfight with the group of mysterious creatures and survived multiple attacks on their home. The story of the Kelly Hopkinsville visitation is one of the most interesting tales of an extraterrestrial meeting. It fits into an interesting narrative of the many cryptid and UFO sightings that plagued the eastern seaboard in the mid-20th century. At the time of the attacks, the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter turned the nation on its head. The visitation happened in the middle of UFO fever when everyone was seeing flying saucers, but there was something different about this case. Not only did the people involved see a spacecraft, but they came face to face with the creatures who were piloting it. Did 11 people really fight off aliens in 1955, or did they make the whole thing up? I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show! And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to connect with me on social media, and more. Coming up in this episode… In the deep jungles of the Congo, natives tell of a giant creature that, once described, sounds exactly like a long-necked dinosaur. But how could this be? And is it pure legend? Perhaps not, as one noted biologist from the area saw it with his own eyes and reported it. We'll look at the supposed real sighting of Mokeli Mbembe, the living dinosaur of the Congo. Running a club during Prohibition was extremely lucrative and extremely dangerous, as one Theodore Lakoff would have learned had he been awake when he was murdered. Benjamin Franklin was known not just as one of the fathers of the United States of America, but also as an inventor, a womanizer, and a man with a bit of an ornery streak in him, as is evidenced by a series of letters he wrote to the New England Courant, where he pretended to be a woman. The Internet is a vital part of modern life. Without web access, all kinds of businesses and jobs would be unable to function. So, as you can imagine, there are plenty of people who would love to see the Internet crumble, and many have tried to make it happen. In 1983, sightings poured in from people on the California coast who claim they saw a sea monster. But first, it's considered one of the most bizarre and convincing extraterrestrial events ever reported. We'll look at the alien encounter that took place in 1955 outside of Hopkinsville, Kentucky, that was experienced by two terrified families. We begin with that story. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. As night fell on Kelly, an unincorporated area outside of Hopkinsville, Kentucky, on August 21, 1955, Billy Ray Taylor was taking a trip to the family well. He was staying in Glennie Lankford's farmhouse with the Sutton family and others, some of which, like Taylor, had recently left the carnival life. As Taylor drew his water, something bright shot across the sky. Taylor believed that he saw a spaceship zip through the clouds and land behind a patch of trees. 
However, when he told everyone inside about the round, metallic object with rainbow-colored streaks trailing behind it, no one believed him. Apparently, Taylor was known to tell tall tales, so everyone assumed he was trying to get a rise out of them. No one believed Billy when he told them about seeing a spaceship pass overhead, but he was convincing enough that his friend Lucky went back to the well with him to check it out. There was nothing at the well, but on their way back to the house, the two men saw a glowing figure walking out of the woods, holding its hands over its head. The two men ran back to the house and began to barricade the doors. The initial news report of the case claims that there were 12 creatures surrounding the household that evening. The little gray men seemed confused. They approached the house one by one and acted very strange. They peeked through the windows, tried to get in through the front door, and even floated up into a tree at one point. The families armed themselves with a 12-gauge shotgun and a 22 caliber rifle and waited. When one of the creatures pressed its face against the screen window, Billy Ray Taylor fired, but nothing happened. The screen was destroyed, but the creature simply disappeared. Taylor, Lucky, and some of the other men went outside, where they were nearly ambushed by a creature waiting for them on the roof. A taloned claw allegedly swiped at Taylor before floating away. After going back inside, more creatures appeared, and more shots were fired, but the bullets didn't affect the creatures. The family said the sounds of the bullets hitting the creatures was similar to that of ammunition hitting a sheet of metal. After the one-sided gun battle, the families settled down and tried to figure out what to do next. The elderly Glennie Lankford came to the conclusion that the small gray creatures with spindly, useless legs and human-like hands weren't trying to harm anyone, but she also didn't want them on her property. When the group felt the coast was clear, everyone piled into their cars and drove to the police station in Hopkinsville. When the family arrived, they were pretty freaked out. The police didn't know how to handle the situation. It occurred eight years after the Roswell incident, and everyone was seeing flying saucers nowadays. The cops went out to the farmhouse to investigate, but all they found were signs of a gun battle. Information travels quickly in a rural area like Hopkinsville, and within the hour, the small farmhouse was crawling with police and members of the local media. From there, the story exploded. Rather than shy away from the fact that their town plays a part in a very strange UFO case, the good people of Hopkinsville, Kentucky have leaned in to their mysterious past. In 2010, the town began hosting an annual Little Green Men Festival, a four-day event filled with ufologists, hayrides, and crafts. There's even live music. Hopkinsville, not a town to shy away from the press, dubbed itself Eclipseville in 2017 to draw in tourists hoping to witness the totality of the coming eclipse. When asked if the celestial event might bring extraterrestrials to the area, Joanne Smithy, vice president and chairperson of the Little Green Men Festival, said, as far as aliens returning, you never know. Some people say they are already among us, others say they don't exist, period. Critics of the encounter note that the details about the creatures, from the way they floated to the mention of glowing eyes to the talons with which the family was attacked, sound incredibly similar to that of a great horned owl. These owls are noted for their aggressive behavior and have been confused for aliens before, most notably, according to skeptics at least, in the Mothman case. Great horned owls are fairly large. They can grow up to two feet tall and have little tufts of feathers on top of their heads that look similar to ears. They're nocturnal, so it makes sense that they would attack at night. The little gray men floated away when shot at, which sounds a lot like owls flying. While some have tried to combat the claims of an encounter with paranormal beings by claiming those involved were likely drunk, there's no evidence to support that theory. When the police investigated, they reportedly concluded alcohol was not involved, and despite a spurious rumor of moonshine, the police didn't find that either. For Joanne Smithy, the idea of alcohol being involved is ludicrous. We all laugh at that because Langford didn't allow alcohol or even cursing on her property. They were a very quiet, trustworthy family. Late in the evening, on August 21st, after the police and local media had gone home, the family tried to settle in for the night but they were not able to rest. Around 3 a.m., the creatures allegedly returned. They began running across the roof and scratching at the house. The neighbors claimed that instead of fighting off aliens for the second time in one night, 
the families decided to pack up and head for Evansville, Indiana. The families were definitely afraid of something, but whether it was aliens, gremlins, another claim, or owls is up for debate. One of the most consistent details of the Kelly Hopkins event is the idea of an eerie glow. Billy Taylor saw a rainbow light following the spaceship, and after the shootout, the family claims they saw an emerald glow illuminating the woods, not to mention the glowing figures and their glowing eyes. Some skeptics believe the family was actually witnessing foxfire or a bioluminescent fungus on decaying wood. The color of foxfire tends to be a bright green, which looks unworldly even when you know what you're looking at. Project Blue Book, spearheaded by the United States Air Force from 1952 to 1969, sought to research claims of unidentified flying objects. It was the third project of its kind, following Project Sign and Project Grudge. According to researchers, the U.S. military never found evidence of UFOs or extraterrestrial life. Project Blue Book didn't officially investigate this case because they thought the whole thing was a hoax. They recorded the sighting with the notes CP, standing for Crackpot. Even though the Kelly Hopkinsville sighting didn't convince the world of extraterrestrials or little gray men with talons, it did inspire a rash of sci-fi stories. Supposedly, Critters, a 1986 Gremlins knockoff about a farm family fighting off a bunch of creepy aliens who crash land while riding a meteor, is based on the Kelly Hopkinsville story. The Kelly Hopkinsville events also found their way into the X-Files comic book in an issue subtitled Crop Duster. Despite what the people in charge of the Little Green Men Festival say, many in Hopkinsville didn't believe the story when it was first told. The details changed depending on which person was recounting the details, and newspaper stories at the time were inconsistent. Skeptics cling to the discrepancies, claiming they prove the families were all imagining things. Over the course of the local news cycle, the descriptions of the creatures that attacked the farmhouse changed drastically. They were initially described as a little over two feet tall with thin legs and gray coloring, but then things changed. The beings went from gray to green in one newspaper article, and they were given a greenish-silver glow in a later version of the story. In one article, the creatures were described as four feet tall and were given bulbous heads, while in others, they had pointed ears and claws for hands. It's hard to tell if reporters were adding embellishments to the creatures to make the story more interesting, or if the various family members just saw different features or imagined different things. Up next, we'll look at a supposed real sighting of Mokeli Mbembe, the living dinosaur of the Congo, when Weird Darkness returns. Strange creatures, gruesome murders, oozing organisms, unfathomable abductions, enigmatic expeditions, an age-old malevolence, and much more. Author J.C. Moore delivers a collection of dark horror tales that are both chilling and poignant. Dark Intrigues Book One is filled with horror fiction for fans of short story anthologies, horror collections, ghost fiction, suspense, Possession, and more. Dark Intrigues Book One by J.C. Moore, available on Kindle or as an audiobook narrated by Darren Marlar. Find Dark Intrigues Book One on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. In the summer of 1983, dramatic news was received from the People's Republic of the Congo. A new expedition, which had been sent by the Congolese government to the Likula Swamps, had reached Lake Teli, and the expedition leader, Marcelin Agnagna, had observed Mokeli Mbembe, 
the supposed sauropod dinosaur reported for over two centuries by natives, explorers, and missionaries. This is the first time that a professional biologist claims to have seen a living dinosaur, which is in itself a landmark event. Upon returning to Brazzaville, the capital, in May 1983, Agnogna wrote up his official report to the Ministry of Water and Forests, the copy of which was subsequently forwarded to ISC Vice President Roy Mackle and Secretary Richard Greenwell. They, in turn, had the report translated from French to English. Mackle and Greenwell know Agnogna well, as he was the biologist representing the Congolese government on the 1981 Mackle expedition and they're convinced that he is both a competent biologist and trustworthy individual. In the meantime, a field report by Agnogna providing the basic information on his expedition, including the sighting, was published in the second 1983 volume of Cryptozoology. Interest in Mokele Mbembe increased in the 1970s following extensive bibliographic work on possible living dinosaurs in Africa by Bernard Huvelmans. James Powell collected reports in Gabon and later teamed up with Mackle to penetrate the unexplored Lakula swamps in the Congo. Their 1980 expedition, aided by local missionary Eugene Thomas, collected many reports, but they were unable to reach Lake Telly, the most identifiable supposed habitat of the animal. Mackle then teamed up with Herman Rugesters and Richard Greenwell, but differences between the first two separated Rugesters from the expedition. Joining Mackle and Greenwell were Justin Wilkinson and Marie Womack, and in the Congo, Agnogna, and Pastor Thomas. Regusters, meanwhile, proceeded with his own plans with his wife Kia, which resulted in the bizarre situation of two American expeditions being in the Lukuala swamps at the same time. They never encountered one another, however. The Mackle team navigated the river systems using sonar, and the Rugusters team, which was there longer, remained at Lake Telly. Upon returning to the United States in early November 1981, both groups claimed some success. The Mackle team had encountered a wake in a river caused by a large, unidentified submerging animal, neither elephant nor hippo, and had found a trail left by a large, unidentified animal, not an elephant. The Rugusters team, however, claimed actual sightings at Lake Telly. Skepticism was expressed by the media at Rugusters press conferences as he failed to produce clear photographic evidence. Further, his claims of great depth for the lake, hundreds of feet, contradicted previous French hydrographic findings in 1976, which found the lake to be very shallow, less than 10 feet. The official report by Agnogna now confirms that the lake is indeed very shallow, but vindicates, or at least supports, Rugusters' claimed observations of the animal itself. Rugusters, meanwhile, had submitted a research report to Cryptozoology magazine on the analysis of the sound recordings which he made at Lake Telly and which he believes contain trumpeting calls made by Mokele Mbembe. The new Congolese expedition was composed of seven persons, four from the Ministry of Water and Forest, including Agnogna, who led the team, and three from other ministries. The expedition left Brazzaville by air on April 3, 1983, for Apina on the Likuala River. After several days of preparation, they proceeded by dugout on the Likuala, south to the confluence of the Likuala and Bai rivers, and further south on the Lukawala to Buwanila. They then worked their way back north to Bai, visiting villages and seeking evidence from possible witnesses. The Mackle team had gone north on the Bai, so part of this was new territory. Villages visited there were Makongo, Matongo, Edzama, Jeek, and Boha. At Edzama, an incident had occurred only two weeks prior to the team's arrival. A young girl had observed an enormous animal when canoeing on the river but details were sketchy. The team was able to verify that the sandbar against which her dugout had reportedly been pushed by the animal was still swept clean, as if by the resting body of a bulky animal. At Jeek, the team talked to the same elephant hunter who had shown the Mackle expedition the trail of an unidentified animal. Fresh tracks were found in the same location and were estimated to be less than four days old. The same individual claimed observations of Mokele Mbembe on three separate occasions in the 17 months since the Mackle expedition had been there. All involved descriptions of long necks protruding from the water and of the animal feeding on nearby vegetation. In his report, Agnogna notes that Mangumela, the witness, is one of the few witnesses who remains unmystified by the presence of these animals. He considers them as natural to the ecology of the area as others he encounters. Proceeding north to Boha, 
the team encountered great difficulty in obtaining the cooperation of the villagers who own Lake Telly, despite the fact that Agnagna's group represented the government. After a week of negotiation, the villagers agreed to allow the team to go to the lake. The long 60-kilometer trek began early on April 26th and lasted over two days. It proved to be extremely difficult negotiating a passage through the swamp forest with equipment and provisions. Seven Boha villagers accompanied the expedition. A base camp was established on the eastern side of the lake. Two full days of observing at Lake Telly produced no sightings of Mukele Mbembe, but other faunal observations were made. On May 1st, Agnagna and two Boha villagers, Jean-Charles Dinkumbo and Isaac Manzamoy, left the camp early in the morning to explore the forest near the lake and observed the local fauna. At about 2.30 p.m., Agnagna was filming a troop of monkeys when Dinkumbu fell into a pool of muddy water. He went to the edge of the lake to wash himself and a few minutes later began calling his companions to come quickly. The others joined him but were at first unable to see what he was pointing at excitedly. The thick vegetation ends abruptly at the water's edge with no break or beach between the trees and the water. They were then able to see a large animal out of the lake, an estimated distance of 300 meters away. It had a long neck, small head, and large back, and its length visible above the water was thought to be 5 meters or 15 feet. Agnagna immediately recognized that it was not part of the known fauna of Central Africa, and in fact, that it greatly resembled a Mesozoic sauropod in morphology. In his field report to Cryptozoology magazine, Agnagna states that the emotion and alarm at this sudden, unexpected event disrupted the author's attempt to film the animal. What happened, as has subsequently been determined, is that Agnagna, with only a little film left on his last roll, began filming steadily after recovering from the shock and began wading out into the lake to get closer, despite fearful shouting by Dikombu. At some point, he realized that in his haste, he had forgotten to take off the movie camera's lens cap, which he then did and continued to film, uncertain if there was actually any unexposed film left in the camera. The subsequent development of the film in a French laboratory, Agnagna hand carried it, proved that his fears were correct. The end of the film developed black. Agnagna continued to wade toward the animal for a distance of 60 meters or about 200 feet and the animal moved its head around as if to determine the source of the noise. Agnagna, who includes a drawing of the animal in his field report in the journal, described the front part as brown while the back part of the neck appeared black and shone in the sunlight. The animal then submerged, leaving its neck and head above the water. It remained this way for another 20 minutes and then submerged completely. Agnagna and the two Boha natives then rapidly trekked back through the forest to the camp, about two kilometers or three miles away. They immediately went out on the lake in a small dugout, this time armed with video equipment, but the animal did not reappear. Another day of observing produced no results, and the team then had to return to Apina to rendezvous with the aircraft supposedly being sent to pick them up. The expedition left Lake Tele for Boha on May 3rd and then went by dugout upriver to Apina. However, the expected aircraft never arrived, and after waiting a week, the team was forced to make its way by foot across swamps and through the Great Forest to Imfondo on the Ubangi River. The distance covered was over a hundred kilometers or 60 miles, and the expedition members were forced to call upon all their physical resources to make their way back. They flew to Brazzaville on May 17th, bringing the expedition to a close after 45 days. In his report, Agnagna is quite emphatic about his observation. He states, it can be said with certainty that the animal we saw was Mokeli Mbembe, that it was quite alive, and furthermore, that it is known to many inhabitants of the Lakula region. In a recent personal communication to Mackle, he states, Mokeli Mbembe is a species of sauropod living in the Lukuala swamps and rivers. I saw the animal, but I didn't have experienced photographers or other scientists with me. It may be hard to convince people because I didn't get any pictures. I'm not going to let it end like this. A return must be made to the Likuala, perhaps for a lengthy stay, to get the needed proof." Undoubtedly, Agnanga is disappointed that, in the emotion at the moment, he failed in his task to film such a remarkable animal. His word alone, despite his credentials, is certainly not proof of anything, but perhaps zoologists and paleobiologists will now examine the possibility of living dinosaurs with a little more interest. 
Egnogna received his graduate training in terrestrial mammalogy at the University of Havana, Cuba. He is one of only two biologists in the Congo and is affiliated with the Brazzaville Zoo, an agency of the Ministry of Water and Forests. What happens next is anybody's guess. Egnogna hopes to get his government to sponsor a new expedition, but he proposes better equipment and personnel. The Congolese Minister of Information visited Mackel in Chicago recently, and it's hoped that a collaborative program will eventually be worked out. The main problem, as usual, is money. The Congolese have limited budgets, and most U.S. funding sources are reluctant to support projects which are not in the mainstream of science and are less likely to produce conclusive results quickly. Perhaps the published article by Agnogna in Cryptozoology magazine will change all of that. If the animal is, in fact, a dinosaur, its verification would have a dramatic impact on paleobiology, science generally, and of course the public consciousness, fully vindicating the role of cryptozoology as well as eyewitness reports from the native peoples of the world, who often know more about their own environment than is recognized by Western science. When Weird Darkness returns, running a club during Prohibition was extremely lucrative and extremely dangerous, as Juan Theodore Lakoff would have learned had he been awake when he was murdered. But first, the Internet is a vital part of modern life. Without web access, all kinds of businesses and jobs would be unable to function. So as you can imagine, there are plenty of nasty people out there who would love to see the Internet crumble, and many have tried to make it happen. That's up next. I'm a man of habits. Okay, truth be told, my bride says I'm boring. I like the same stuff, and that's what I stick with, and that includes what I eat. Even for breakfast, I used to opt for leftover pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Uh, did, did I mention pizza? Anyway, now that I'm trying to lose weight and cut back on the carbs, I've had to make changes for breakfast. Now, instead of a big, heavy breakfast, I just grab one of my Built Bars, the best-tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bars satisfy my hunger with up to 19 grams of protein and also satisfy my sugar craving, despite being less than 3 grams of sugar. And at only about 150 calories per bar, if I'm really hungry in the morning, I can grab two of them and still feel good about it. Try replacing your dessert, or even a meal like breakfast, with a Built Bar. You won't even know it's not really a candy bar. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built and build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. Since Tim Berners-Lee launched the World Wide Web in the late 1980s, there have been numerous attempts to shut down the Internet completely. Some of these attacks were carried out by coordinated military groups and governments in a bid for political control. Others consisted of one irate man ripping the wires out of a service box. From accidental cyber attacks to foiled terrorist plots, here are a few times that people had a go and in some cases succeeded at shutting down the Internet. Nobody likes to be humiliated online, but one man took his quest to hide embarrassing videos to the extreme. In 2016, a Chinese man known as Lu worried that someone would upload footage of him dancing to the web. So Lu decided to take matters into his own hands and set out to destroy the Internet. That summer, having recently moved to the city of Waifang, he had decided to join in with a public fitness dance. In China, it's common for middle-aged women to gather in the streets and take part in granny dances. Lou chose to join one of those granny dances to the amusement of some of the locals. He told police that passersby were giggling and recording him on their phones. Lou thought little of it at the time, but a few months later he began to worry that the footage might be shared online. And this was when he decided to take action. One night in August, Lou broke into four China Telecom service boxes and ripped out the insides. In total, he caused 10,000 won or about $15,000 worth of damage. 
but Lou was spotted multiple times on CCTV and subsequently arrested by local police. For 16 months, starting in March 2018, the country of Chad faced the longest social media blackout in African history. Only 6.5% of people had regular internet access. People were unable to interact with their loved ones. Local businesses struggled to advertise online. Journalists had to fight to get their voices heard. The government imposed the ban in response to growing dissent. Critics have described President Idris Deby as a democratically bankrupt leader and accused him of mass censorship. They claim that he was clinging to power and that the social media ban was a desperate attempt to quell anti-government activists. As IT experts CIPESA explained in a recent report, African governments with democracy deficits, regardless of the number of citizens that use the Internet, recognize and fear the power of the Internet in empowering ordinary people to speak truth to power. The web is rife with hackers and malware, but few caused as much damage as the Mirai botnet. The attack devastated U.S. systems when it brought down much of the country's Internet in October 2016. It targeted the IT company Dyn, which controlled a large amount of online infrastructure at the time. The digital assault caused a major Internet outage. It affected major websites like Twitter, Netflix, and CNN. The Mirai botnet was a sophisticated kind of cyber attack, known as a Distributed Denial of Service, or DDoS. Computer servers are inundated with traffic until they become overwhelmed and the system shuts down. Experts estimate that Mirai was the largest DDoS attack in history. Hackers infiltrated a vast array of devices, including digital cameras and video players, and then forced them to attack Dyn's servers. Yemen is in the grip of one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world today. Since 2015, Houthi rebels have been locked in a devastating battle with Saudi-led coalition forces. The Houthis are known to use the Internet as a weapon, plunging the country into a web blackout. In July 2018, 80% of Internet users were left stranded after rebel forces severed the country's main fiber-optic cable. The rebel forces slashed the cable while strengthening their defenses in the Red Sea port of Hodeida. The rebels imposed bans on social media networks and slow down the speed of the already weakened internet service, explained telecommunications minister Lutfi Basharif, and this comes amid reports they intend to soon cut off the internet completely to cover their crimes. As is the case with most modern political conflicts, in Myanmar the internet is a key battlefield. When the military junta seized power in February 2021, they were keen to suppress online dissent. The coup leaders quickly shut off all mobile data in the country and wireless broadband soon followed. At least 535 have been killed since the military takeover. But the people of Myanmar are refusing to bow down to these hostile forces. The night before the broadband blackout, there was a surge of people pointing to radio channels and communication apps that can be used without internet access. Protesters took to the streets for a defiant vigil, using candles to declare, we will never surrender. In 1988, Cornell graduate student Robert Tappan Morris was working on a way to measure the size of the Internet. Little did he know he would end up launching the world's first cyber attack. Morris created a program that would jump from computer to computer, counting each one. Every time his program entered a new machine, it would send a brief signal back to a central server which kept count. The trouble is his program, now known as the Morris Worm, spread too quickly and ended up clogging up much of the web. The bug tore through the net, copying itself between each device and pinging back to the server. Morris had inadvertently invented the DDoS cyber attack, a type of digital assault that forces devices to overwhelm a server with traffic. His accidental offensive brought the internet to its knees. Three scuba divers were arrested off the port of Alexandria after attempting to slice through an undersea internet cable and bring down the Egyptian web. The Egyptian Coast Guard intercepted the team before they were able to cause any disruption. In 2013, Egyptian naval forces published images online of three men tied up that they accused had tried to sabotage an internet cable. At the time of the attack, Egyptian online traffic was connected to Europe via eight cables. So cutting one of the cables would not have destroyed the web, but it would have caused a significant disturbance. The men refused to reveal the motive for their foiled attack, 
or if they were working for anyone. In recent years, India has blocked Internet access more than any other country. The blackouts began around the time the government introduced a contentious citizenship law in 2019. Since then, the country has seen a surge in protesters taking a stand against the Hindu nationalist regime. Authorities often responded by suspending the Internet. They claim it is essential to keep the peace. But many Indians have accused officials of attacking their free speech. The most prominent Internet blackout occurred after Modi's government shut down services in the region of Jammu and Kashmir in August of 2019. Over 30 million people were left stranded for 18 months before the web was finally restored in February 2021. In 2002, the Internet was struck by what technology experts at the time called the largest and most complex DDoS attack ever. Cyber attackers orchestrated an onslaught of traffic against the 13 root servers that, at the time, formed the heart of Internet communications. Fortunately, built-in safeguards prevented the web from being taken offline, but had the hour-long offensive lasted longer, it could have had severe repercussions for Internet users across the globe. Digital security expert Chris Morrow described the barrage as probably the most concerted attack against the Internet infrastructure that we've seen. The only way to stop such attacks is to fix the vulnerabilities on the machines that ultimately get taken over and used to launch them, according to another security expert, Alan Power. There's no defense once the machines are under the attacker's control. And the most recent attempt, at least at the time of this recording. In 2021, a man from Texas was arrested for plotting to blow up the Internet. Seth Aaron Penley allegedly planned to take out 70% of the web by destroying a data center in Virginia with a C4 explosive. The U.S. Department of Justice told reporters that Penley planned to target the servers of the FBI and CIA. It said he wanted to tear down the oligarchy that currently rules the United States. Authorities were tipped off to Penley's plot by one of his friends. According to reporters, he was an active member of extremist websites where he went by the name of Dionysus, the Greek god of wine and ritual madness. He wrote on a forum, My Militia, about his desire to conduct a little experiment. He also boasted about taking a sawed-off AR rifle to the storming of the Capitol building but claims that he left it in the car. Had Penley carried out his attack, it would not have destroyed 70% of the Internet. The physical infrastructure is distributed across the world and backed up multiple times. Penley now faces up to 20 years in federal prison if he is found guilty. Theodore Lakoff had dreams like many who came from far away to call Rockford, Illinois their home. He traveled from his home country of Bulgaria to Liverpool, England in 1911. He was only 18 years old when he stepped off the passenger ship Baltic in the New York Harbor. Theodore traveled to Chicago and was living there in 1913. He would spend the next several years working a variety of jobs and moving around quite a bit before settling in New Diggins, Wisconsin. One article mentioned that the young man worked at several supper clubs in Wisconsin before arriving in the Roscoe, Illinois area in 1930. Theodore operated his own roadhouse resort on Rockford's North 2nd Street from 1930 to the beginning of 1931. The resort was long suspected of hosting illegal operations from serving alcohol – this was during Prohibition – to gambling and girls. Theodore also used several different names by early 1930. Tony Evanoff must have been a favorite of his. It appears in newspaper articles almost as often as Theodore Lakoff. On Saturday, January 3, 1931, Theodore had a full house. People were still celebrating the new year, and the card games were in full swing, as well as the liquor sales. George Farmer from Beloit, Wisconsin would later testify that he was one of the last to leave just after midnight. Theodore lived at the resort, and he followed the stragglers outside to wish everyone a happy new year before heading back inside. On Sunday, Ted Manley showed up for an appointment with Theodore at around 10 a.m. He thought it strange the doors were still locked. He knocked, but Theodore did not answer. Manley decided to check in with Theodore's manager, Charles Smith, to see if he knew of the man's location. Smith was so startled to hear the doors of the resort were still locked, he decided to accompany Manley back to the roadhouse. They later stated that they had both had an eerie feeling as they unlocked the door and stepped inside. 
This feeling grew as they made their way to the back portion of the place where Theodore was known to sleep on a couch. This is exactly where they found him. Theodore was curled up on the couch, his hands under his head. Or what was left of his head. It wasn't long before Sheriff William C. Bell and Coroner Walter Julian arrived. They theorized that whoever killed Theodore had hid in the roadhouse sometime during the evening's festivities. The assailant waited in the dark until Theodore was asleep before he crept from his hiding spot and fired the gun into the top of Theodore's head. The shot killed him instantly. A thorough search was made but only deepened the mystery for the authorities. Theodore's wallet was laying on the floor, completely empty. Witnesses from the night before stated that Theodore had around $100 in the wallet, but the search proved that there was a lot more money on hand that was not taken. They believed the wallet was only emptied to make it appear that robbery was the motive for the shooting. Of course, being a resort owner during the turbulent years of Prohibition opened the possible motives up tremendously. There were often rival gangs that used strong-arm tactics to convince the owners to purchase their liquor from their particular stock. Authorities focused on this theory pretty quickly. But after questioning several of Theodore's closest friends, they began to change their minds. These friends told of a young woman who was giving Theodore some trouble. Viola Hunsvicker may have been only 20 years old at the time of Theodore's murder, but she had earned the reputation of being very street smart. Viola had worked for Theodore at the Roadhouse for a short time, but something must have happened between Theodore and the young woman. The witnesses told the authorities that Viola was extorting money from Theodore. They heard horrible arguments between the two and stated that Theodore had stated he was not going to pay her any more money. When Viola was picked up by the sheriff's deputies and her apartment searched, they found two guns. One of them was Theodore's gun that many people had seen him carry. The other gun was of the same caliber of the weapon that was used in the murder. Viola stated that she had never seen the guns before. Sheriff Bell arrested the young woman but continued to question acquaintances of the slain man. Bell also sent the slug retrieved from Theodore and the gun found in Viola's possession to Chicago. The results came back after two weeks. They did not match, and Viola was released. As the police delved into Theodore's personal life, they were astonished to find five other women who were under the impression that they were Theodore's only girlfriend. Some of these women also had boyfriends and even husbands that added to the potential motives for wanting Theodore dead. The authorities developed many other theories in the days following Theodore's death and followed many leads. They always believed that whoever had killed Theodore was probably close to him. But like several other killings during Prohibition, Theodore's murder was never solved. He was buried in East Lawn Cemetery in Beloit, Wisconsin. Coming up, Benjamin Franklin was known not just as one of the fathers of the United States of America, but also as an inventor, a womanizer, and a man with a bit of an ornery streak in him, as is evidenced by a series of letters that he wrote to the New England Courant, where he pretended to be a woman. When Weird Darkness Returns Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. In 1722, a series of letters was published in the New England Courant by a middle-aged widow called Silence Duguid. The letters were extremely witty, 
and it seemed that she had a gift for satire. A new letter appeared from her every few weeks, poking fun at religious hypocrisy, life in colonial America, the persecution of women, fashion, and the pretensions of Harvard College. The letters from Mrs. Silence Duguid became hugely popular, but no one had any idea who the woman was or where she came from. However, many male readers were so impressed and delighted with her writing they even offered to marry her, sight unseen. But unfortunately, Mrs. Silence Duguid never existed in reality. Instead, she was a creation of none other than Benjamin Franklin, a founding father who helped to draft the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. Many know Franklin as a Philadelphia writer. However, the popular printer, inventor, statesman, and writer started out as a mischievous boy from Boston. He was born in 1706 and was the 15th child of Josiah Franklin, a shop owner and candle maker. During his childhood, he explored the colonial city, mill ponds, streets, getting into trouble and getting an education along with it. When Benjamin was eight years old, his father enrolled him in grammar school and prepared him for a life in the ministry. Benjamin was a quick learner and did very well in his studies. However, the fees were too expensive for his father, who later withdrew Benjamin from school and put him to work in the shop. After that, Benjamin Franklin educated himself from books that he borrowed or bought and whenever he was able to find time from his work. And then, when Franklin was 16 years old, he introduced the readers of Boston to a funny middle-aged widow named Mrs. Silence Duguid. After a few years working in his father's shop, the 12-year-old Franklin apprenticed to his elder brother James Franklin, a printer. While working in the print shop, he was able to read the books before returning them, which helped him to gain knowledge. When his brother started publishing the New England Courant, a local newspaper, Benjamin used to carry the papers to the customers. James Franklin would often publish his own friend's writing, which created eagerness in his younger brother to have his own writing in the paper. Therefore, the 16-year-old Franklin devised a plan to disguise himself as a writer. At night, he would put the letter in front of the printing house door, from where it was retrieved and published. James and his friends never guessed the true identity of the author who wrote the letters and Benjamin his authorship. For over six months, Benjamin's letters were published, written from a perspective and voice of Mrs. Silence Duguid, who was witty, charming, and satirical. All the letters were quite delightful, criticizing in a fun way the manners in Boston, Harvard, fashion-related things, and the colonial streets. The letters were especially sarcastic about Harvard College, saying that the students there learned nothing so much as how to become boastful. She commented on certain fashion absurdities of the time, drinking habits of Boston, and much more. Silence Duguid was free with her advice and wrote openly about the way women should be treated. Her writings charmed the people of Boston who appreciated them as social satire. Several men in Boston were so impressed with her work, they wrote to the paper offering proposals of marriage. After writing for six months, the letters from Silence Do Good suddenly stopped, leaving her readership distraught. In response, James Franklin published an advertisement about her in his own paper, saying that whoever finds the true Mrs. Silence Do Good account at any cost will get thanks for such pains. After this, Benjamin Franklin unveiled his identity and disclosed that he was the widow to all Boston people, including his brother. James Franklin was not at all happy with his brother's success. The rivalry between the siblings caused Benjamin Franklin to break the apprenticeship terms and go away from Boston. He then went to Philadelphia, where he set up his own press and started publishing the Pennsylvania Gazette. In 1730, the Pennsylvania Gazette published a sensational article describing a witch trial that happened in Mount Holly near Burlington. As per the article, more than 300 people witnessed the trial of a man and woman who were accused of conducting witchcraft. They were accused of making sheep dance, hogs speak, and many other unnatural acts. As a result, they were put to the test to prove their innocence. In one of the tests, they were weighed and compared to the weight of a Bible. If they weighed more, then they were considered not to be witches. In another, they would be tied and thrown in water. If the suspects floated, then they would be considered witches. All of the accused passed the Bible test, but in the second test, one of the accusers panicked and floated. Dissent broke out with some people supporting the accuser while others did not. Such an account of the witch trial had a major grip on the readers in Philadelphia. Nevertheless, the story was not true, because apart from anything else, witch trials did not happen in America in 1730. 
the report was not true at all. The author behind the Pennsylvania Gazette account of the witch trial was not known for over a century, until the research of John McMaster showed that the article was yet another fictional work of Benjamin Franklin. Franklin was responsible for several more such hoaxes throughout his life, on his way to becoming one of the most famous Americans of all time. Personally, I consider sea serpents more credible than lake monsters. It's the logistics of it all. The sea is vast, and we move across it with noisy vessels along narrow sea lanes. Anything could be there. Lakes are small and tend to be surrounded by people. What lives there ought to be seen a lot more often. Yet when I was researching the digitalized files of Australian newspapers for Australian and foreign sea serpents, I noticed something peculiar. Up to the Second World War, it was respectable to see and report sea serpents, often uncritically. However, once the war started, people had much more important things to talk about, and after that date, although it has become respectable to see and report lake monsters, reports of sea serpents dropped off dramatically. But they still turn up. One case was in late 1983 off the coast of California. Again, I have the old International Society of Cryptozoology to thank for the summary the same article, by the way, that we had the Mokeli Mbembe article from. Although the article is anonymous, the author was almost certainly the editor, J. Richard Greenwell. Here's the article. Headline, Sea Serpents Seen Off California Coast. The ISC Newsletter, Volume 2, Number 4, Pages 9 and 10, Winter, 1983. A new sea serpent sighting took place at Stinton Beach, north of San Francisco, California, on October 31, 1983. The incident involved several witnesses, five of whom were members of a construction crew repairing Highway 1 on a Marin County cliffside overlooking the sea. Shortly before 2 p.m., according to Stephen Rubenstein of the San Francisco Chronicle, who interviewed the witnesses, a flagman named Gary saw the unidentified animal swimming towards the cliff, and he called Matt Ratto, another crew member on his two-way radio, telling him to get his binoculars. The binoculars were reportedly used by the crew to observe distant objects of interest particularly nude sunbathers on the beach below during their lunch breaks. Ratto watched the animal through the binoculars. It was reportedly only a quarter of a mile or 400 meters away and about 100 yards offshore. Of particular interest was the detail that the animal was being followed by about 100 birds and two dozen sea lions. There were three bends, like humps, and they rose straight up, said Ratto. Then the head came up to look around. The serpent then turned, lowering its head beneath the surface and moved out to sea, gradually lowering its humps beneath the water until it disappeared. Look, Ratto told reporters, I'm not a psycho, I'm a regular guy. If I was going to make up something, I'd make up something like a 12-foot Mickey Mouse with five arms. The animal was described by all witnesses as dark, slim, and about 100 feet or 30 meters in length. Another witness, truck driver Steve Bora, said, the sucker was going 45 to 50 miles an hour which is 70 to 80 kilometers per hour. It was clipping. It was boogieing. It looked like a long eel. But Boris says he saw only two humps. Marlene Martin, a safety inspector with the Department of Transportation, also saw the animal. She was subsequently unavailable for comment, but her daughter told the Chronicle, Mom came home and told us it was the biggest thing she ever saw in her life, and my mom doesn't lie. She said it made Jaws look like a baby. Apparently, Mrs. Martin described four humps to her family. According to the tabloid Weekly World News, another witness surfaced on the beach itself. Roland Curry, 19, said it was the second time that he'd seen the sea serpent in less than a week. On the first occasion, he claims it was visible for about 30 seconds, but the head appeared for only about two seconds, just before the body submerged. I told my girlfriend about it, and she said I was nuts, commented Curry, but this time I saw it and there were other people who said they saw it. That makes it real in my book. From now on, when I go to the beach, I'm bringing my camera." The Chronicle also spoke to Jack Swenson, a biologist of the nearby Point Reyes Bird Observatory, who said there have been periodic sightings of unknown marine animals off the Marin County coast and that no one ever figures out what the sightings are. 
A whale surfacing in backlit sunshine, silhouetted with a lot of glare, could look like the Loch Ness Monster. On the other hand, there may be all sorts of prehistoric creatures swimming around out there we know nothing about. Witness Rado was emphatic that there's no way it could have been a whale or a porpoise, and it was too graceful to be a machine. Anyway, a submarine doesn't have a head. Two points add credibility to this incident. One, the construction crew members admitted to having the binoculars to observe nude sunbathers, and although this in itself is of little if any significance in California, the admission tends to indicate a truthful version of the events. And two, a separate witness, Mrs. Martin, who holds a responsible job, saw the same phenomenon, although she later was unavailable. This gives independent support to the claimed sighting by the construction crew. Later in the week, on November 2nd, a group of surfers reported seeing a sea serpent near Costa Mesa. It was just the way they described it up there, a long black eel, said young Hutchinson, 29. The sighting took place in the mid-afternoon, about 60 feet or 18 meters off the Santa Ana River jetty. He thought the observation was too crazy to report, until he read about the Marin County sightings. At first, I thought it was a whale, but I've seen a lot of whales and it didn't look the same, said Hutchinson, who claimed that it surfaced only 10 feet or 3 meters from his surfboard. There were no dorsal fins, he added. The skin texture wasn't the same as a whale, and when it broke water, it wasn't like a whale at all. I didn't see the head or the tail. The Costa Mesa Daily Pilot paper quoted a spokesman for the Corona Del Mar Marine Facility of the California Institute of Technology as stating, it could have been a pilot whale or a gray whale. It could also have been three or four porpoises in a line jumping from the water. The spokesman preferred to remain anonymous. It was really moving, concluded Hutchinson, like a whale with a purpose. We got the hell out of there and paddled for shore. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. And please leave a rating and review of the show in the podcast app you listen from. Doing so helps the show to get noticed. You can also email me anytime with your questions or comments through the website at WeirdDarkness.com. That's also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for the newsletter to win monthly prizes, find my other podcast, Church of the Undead, and more. Plus, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Hopkinsville Encounter was written by Hannah Collins for Ranker.com's Graveyard Shift. The Dinosaur Observed in the Congo is by Richard Greenwell for the ISC Newsletter. The Mysterious Death of Theodore Lakoff was written by Kathy Kressel for HauntedRockford.com. Who Was Mrs. Silence Do Good is by Bippin Dimry for HistoricMysteries.com. Taking Down the World Wide Web was written by Benjamin Thomas for Listverse.com. And The California Sea Monster is by Malcolm Smith from Malcolm's Cryptids. Again, you can find links to all of these stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6-10 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And a final thought. Hang out with people who make you forget to look at your phone. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey Weirdos, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com listen.